Welcome to another week of Level Up with Matt Rogers. I'm your host, Matt Rogers, as always. Thank you for joining us. Super excited you're here. My right-hand man, mixing everything, making me look skinnier on camera, maybe. Yep. Eli Adelman's in the house. How are you? I'm good, man. Had a, you know, a good weekend. I guess we're midweek now, aren't we? Yeah, but yeah. you can still it's talk about your good, weekend. It's been a good week. The good viewers weekend. don't know. Yeah, they have no idea. For all they know, this is whatever day. There no, yeah, man, it was great. And you're blowing up. You're traveling around with uh, big time comedian John Christ. Oh, yeah. How's that life? It's been great, man. Really? Yeah, we were in Huntsville a couple weeks ago, going up to Michigan and Indy next Does weekend. Does he make you laugh more than I do, Eli? Dude, you know what's funny? I've heard his act so many times now. I was like, all right, and this one's coming. All right, this one. You know. You're like, I heard that joke. <laughs> yeah. We so. got to get you in some of this gear. This is bringheaven.us. Make sure you go on and check it out. That's right. They'll get something. Um, are you a football guy? I am a football guy. You are a football guy. Yeah. How long have you been a football fan? Uh, man, I'd say since probably 2002-ish. All right. Yeah. We got a good one today. Yep. We, uh, we've had Super Bowl champions on here before. Uh, so Erlacher, he, how many Pro Bowls did he have? I don't know if, I mean, uh, look at, put it this way. Erlacher wasn't the Pro Bowl MVP. That's true. Like this guest had yeah. a huge, and <laughs> look at uh, our next guest, I'm bringing him in right now. He holds numerous Houston Texan franchise records. He's a two-time Pro Bowler. He's a Pro Bowl MVP. Uh, his college, University of Virginia, actually retired his number. That's so cool. So no one can wear number seven anymore at Virginia. And uh, I do have to highlight this because I announced for the Tennessee Titans. Matt Schaub broke my heart. Many times growing up as a Titans fan, primarily when we played him in 2009, uh, he was the AFC player of the week because against the Titans, not only did he beat us 34-31, but he threw for 357 yards and four touchdowns. And we actually had a decent team that year. And uh, he's the freaking man. He is. Uh, he brought the Houston Texans their first winning record in franchise history and he's with us right now, the one and only Matt Schaub. Let's How go. are you? I'm good, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Dude, I freaking love you for being here. I met you for the first time a year ago. Your awesome wife, Lori Schaub, hired me as their auctioneer, and I met you for the first time. Not going to lie. I fanboyed out on you a little bit. I'm a, I'm a huge <laughs> fan. And... Uh, you dress nice. You're freaking smooth. And uh, I don't know, this last time, we just did another event together this last week. And um, I asked you to come on the show, and you said yes. So thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I got to tell you, thank you for the compliment on the attire and how I dress. I got to tell you, when I saw you both last year and this year's event, I wish I could take credit for it. I mean, that's all Lari. That's all my wife. She, she says, no, wear this, wear that. Nope, this jacket. So... I just put it on. I just I just bring my face. I love it. We I mean, dude, we need our wives. You and I both outkick the coverage with our wives. Lori, your wife, phenomenal. Y'all have five kids. And Lori, she is one of the chairs of the gala for uh Atlanta's uh children's hospital, the children's healthcare hospital. And mm -hmm. she just brought me back for the second year. We were talking before. Is she happy? Are we doing good for the event? Oh, we're doing great. Um a, yeah, it was a no-brainer when we she asked you to come and be the auctioneer last year, and we knocked it out of the park. She was the co-chair awesome. of the auction last year, and and it was just a no-brainer afterwards. It was like, Matt Rogers coming back, That's book cool. him, this is the date. And so, you know, it was just last weekend, and we knocked it out of the park, broke records, and raised over a million and a half dollars in one night and so it was just a great event about 650 people in the room so uh super proud of Lari for all she did and all the commitment that she made still juggling five kids and you know a sixth kid and me at the house and <laughs> planning that event and with your help and and the folks in the room the community loves children's health care of Atlanta I think any of the people that were in that room especially us with five we know what it's about there. We we frequented the ER there with our kids, and so we know the staff. And to be able to help um, in that manner, I mean, the community is so philanthropic here. So is that how you got involved with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta? Is it, you had a a child or children? I don't know the full story. Maybe if you want to share it with us, that had to stay there for a while. 
Well, not necessarily there. So we started, you know, we got married and I was playing with the Texans. And so, but we were married for about two years before oldest was born in 2010. And we, leading up to that, we wanted to start our own foundation. And we, but we didn't know necessarily, we, we wanted education based, we want it um, medical needs based. And once we, she got pregnant and we started going to Texas Children's Hospital there in the Houston area. Mm-hmm. Our heartstrings were with the kids within that hospital. It was like it was a no-brainer. We're on the precipice of being parents that we wanted to lend a hand. So we started our Great Hope Foundation there, had events for the court, rest of my career there. Um, and we were able to help out immensely with their new campus that they were building. And then fast forward, I get traded in after the 2013 season to Oakland. And when my wife was pregnant with our fourth. And um, we had some complications going on there. We had we were at one of the medical facilities there. She was on bed rest for about three months, and our son was born three months premature. And so we had a long stay in the NICU there. And just seeing all the – you don't realize when you're going through it how many people go through similar circumstances, parents and their kids and the struggles and having kids at home and and – and until you go through it right. and once we did it was just man we're, we this is where our heart is and so we moved we were able to find our way back to the atlanta area fortunately to play and finish my career with the falcons and got involved we already knew about children's health care and so she jumped right into the mix on the committees to help and all the events there and so it was a natural progression as she became the auction chair and then the the co-chair this year for the event i mean um, once you have kids and you see some of the struggles that families and the kids go through with these facilities, mm-hmm. it's hard not to want to be involved. And your kids now, especially the one that was in the NICU, totally healthy, happy, fine. Oh, he's doing great. Second grade, uh, full of life, full of energy. Um, it's just uh, incredibly grateful for the staff that was at John Muir Medical Center there in Walnut Creek, California. But I mean, yeah, he's doing great. That's awesome. So how? So you've been with the. Ravens, uh, Raiders, Texans, uh, you were drafted originally by the Falcons. Um, You really, you know, for me, shined with the Texans. You know, primarily that 2009 season, you made another Pro Bowl in 2012. Why didn't you stay, like, why didn't you you and Lori build your family in uh, in Houston? Why did you go back to Atlanta? Because, I mean, you couldn't win anywhere, right? Virginia, Atlanta, Oakland, Baltimore. Why did you pick Atlanta? (laughs) Yeah, so I got drafted in 2004 to the Atlanta Falcons. I backed up Mike Vick for three seasons. Um, and Laurie, she grew up in Alabama, uh, went to Auburn. She was working in the city. And we met in my 2006 season, so my third season. And that was then my third year, so I was a restricted free agent. And there was talk. I played a lot in the preseason because Mike Vick, he wasn't playing in the preseason much. So I got a lot of time. I got to show what I could do. And – Um, It looked like I was going to be traded and the Texans came calling and Gary Kubiak, their head coach. And, um, but I knew as I was, I met Laura, I was like, this is the one. And so we transitioned and we went to Houston. We got married, we had kids. And just the way my career went there, 2013, as it's well documented, it wasn't the best of years um, playing wise. And so uh, my time in Houston ran out and the way that that ended, we knew, okay, we want to move on. It's time to you know, I love the city. We met so many great people, still keep in touch with the people in the community and a lot of friends in the Houston area, but it was time to move on. And my folks are here in the Atlanta area and hers are in Alabama still. So only like three hours away. Yeah. So it was a way to be back um, near family where we met. We have a lot of friends in the Atlanta area here in the Southeast. So it was a natural progression. And for me to come back and finish my last five years with the Falcons or kids in school, it was just a great way yeah. to transition um, out of the game and, you know, plan our roots. You could tell too, man, like I do a lot of events and, you know, there's a lot of different celebrities and athletes there, but you, I could tell like just based off of the pictures that you guys are taking on stage at the end of the night, right? Like everyone takes pictures, but dude, I can tell those people really love you guys. Like you could tell the Shab family means something in the Atlanta community is that just, I mean, obviously the football gave you the platform, kind of opened the door, but you still have to invest and cultivate those relationships, right? How important have relationships been to you and your wife in the community? 
Sure. I mean, a lot of it is from our roots and from our families. You know, I mean, our parents instilled the same values in both Laurie and I at a young age. And and when you sit down with both of our parents, they both have that um, um, relationship based upbringing and and very you know faithful and and just grounded in truth in um, family and that's why we're up there i mean our her brothers and their family and then my sister and her family they came from alabama from pennsylvania because they wanted to be there to support laurie and in the and the event and so it's just incredible and for us with those that are there in the community whether they what they think of us is what they think of us you'd have to ask them but you know, it's a relationship world and, and to be able to shake hands, you know, give out hugs and just thank people and, and be a community because, you yeah. know, we believe in in that. And, you know, so it's just important and it's just the values and what has been instilled in us in, at a young age by our parents. Talk to me about like, so you know, obviously you uh, you shined in Houston, uh, one of the top quarterbacks uh in 2009 you were actually the nfl passing leader beating out you know peyton manning tom Brady, all of them um you passed for the most yards in that 2009 season of course won a pro bowl and then of course again in 2012 you win another pro bowl here's my question one short year later like you said you yeah. knew that you were going to get cut or traded or something how I mean, dude, emotionally, and I'm thinking for the listeners right now that are battling anything, like yesterday might have been the best day of your life, and today you might have gotten a diagnosis. You know, yesterday you thought you were in love, and today you found out that that person's leaving. Whatever it is, how do you keep moving forward and adapt when you are on such a high, and then it just seems like in a glimpse you're starting all over or you're at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. To me, it's something that sports somewhat trains you for adversity. Um, but that that's in a good sense and a bad sense. You have good things happen to you. You could make a game-winning shot or score a touchdown, throw a touchdown pass with no time left to win a game, but you can also throw four pick sixes in four straight games, such as I did, So, which is still an NFL record that I'm proud of. <laughs> but um, all of those things teach you so much, and, and they happen to you, but how do you – how do you reflect on what do you learn? How do you grow? Um, and I think that's what sports ever since I started playing when I was four years old, it just starts to, as the longer you play, those things happen to you and you try to learn how to cope, move on, learn and develop. And what support structures do you have? What, what do you have around you to help you through them? Cause no one can do it alone when you have certain things thrust upon you that are negative, mm -hmm. but it's how are you going to be better? What positives can you take and what, what can you do to prevent a repeat? You know, we always talk about in football, right. like don't be a repeat offender. Well, that that's in life too. Like if you make a mistake, learn from it, assess what happened and try to avoid ha making that same mistake happen again. And for me that, yeah, it was a very emotional time, very trying in my professional career. Cause I realized what that time period meant and where it was going and my trajectory in my career because a lot of times invested and that's what a lot of people don't realize is how much time and effort and energy you put in they only see what happens on sunday afternoon right. um but and what it means to my family i mean during that time i mean there was a lot of we had three kids at the time and you know so they have to deal with me coming home and and which there were good days, bad days, but they were always there. And it was always from a loving place. And so that was where I leaned and that is what helped me get through some of those tough times. So I think it's important to have some sort of support system and structure around you for support and guidance and in whatever that is. Who, you who to, was your you support system? I mean, it, a lot of it was Laurie, my wife, and then my parents. Um, but to be honest with you, I had a great group of guys that I was teammate teammates with as well, that they were so supportive because they saw I internalized a lot, but they saw that I was going to be the same guy even when I got benched day in and day out because I, I'd been there seven years. I'm, I was a leader on the team, a captain. They needed me to still show up for them and be supportive and help get prepared to play when and I did get another chance to go in there. So between my teammates and coaches, you know, some decisions were from the highest up. So, um, 
I did have support from those guys and that meant so much because those are like my, those are my brothers. And, you know, we, we went through a lot together, but I, so I had multiple support systems put in place to help me. And at the same time, I also leaned into probably the most important thing. And that's, that's God and praying. Cause there was so much that I couldn't control, but you know, he does and he is the answers and he's where I leaned. And I, I leaned on that um, with my wife. And that's something that was very important to us just in our everyday life, but especially um, during some of those tough times. Uh, why is God important in, in prayer? And how do you know it's, it's real? You know, it's just something from the beginning, from when, when I would go to church uh, as a young kid and in Sunday school, just, you know, learning and, and learning how to pray, what it means, um, reading scripture, um, learning more about God and the Bible and the truth and the word. And in my talks with other friends and other people that are on their walks, um, you know, similar to me. You know, I think that that's just important conversations to have. And that's that's where I just knew that, you know, that is something to be grounded in. Things change all around you. Right. You know, your life, your journey, um, your job, family, whatever. Like, you know, life, there's ebbs and flows. But God is the light and the truth and it's non-changing it's it's unwavering that's why i think you know i'm obviously a believer as well i talk about god all the time I'm passionate but i think that's one of the biggest misleading or falsely sold things about jesus is a lot of people preach and a lot of people believe that invite jesus into your heart and you'll have a better life life will just be better and they almost sell it like a genie in a bottle type thing to where Jesus will take away all of your problems and you won't ever struggle. So my point is we obviously know that's not true. The same wind falls on us all, the just and the unjust, and we all have the same trials. When you're going through that, um, how do you run towards God instead of getting mad at God and running away from God? Just knowing that he's in control, you know, he, everything is set out. He, there's, there's a reason it's happening. And, you know, there's something that Laurie and I always talk about that will never give us. I mean, this is coming from two people that have five kids and right. there's a lot that goes on with that, but that he's never going to give you anything you can't handle. And, you know, he, he bestowed good, bad, everything in between. And that's to anyone that's several because he, we're all made in the image of God. And so um, but he never gives you something you can't handle, but what you do with that and your perspective and how you handle that, mm -hmm. you know, there's choices. That's why we're all imperfect beings and, you know, we have free will and you, you make choices and you make decisions. And so, and you have to live with the outcomes of right. those decisions and those consequences, but then understanding like, okay, there's always evaluation. You got to evaluate yourself because you have to be critical of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's, in football, in life, in your job, as a parent. Um, but he's the truth right. and the word is the truth. And so that's leaning in on that and always looking in the mirror first was always crucial because it's like, okay, I can handle this, but how should I handle it? And what decision is best, you know, in this instance, whatever awesome. it is. Yeah. And I mean, one of my favorite verses is Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. So when I'm not prospering and I'm in danger and in harm, those are the promises I hold on to. And like Matt was saying, why getting in the word is so important, because when your life is not matching up with the promises of God, you lean harder on the promises of God because they can't fail. So he doesn't say you'll never have trials. He just tells you he'll over, you know, you'll overcome it through him. And that's why. Man, I love talking to people like you that are, have been at the peak. And because I've never met anyone that has gotten to the top without going through some struggles, right? Tell me about, yeah, because you said you had your support system, your crew. Um, how do you find your crew? Because, like, when, you, you, when you're an NFL quarterback, you're a top NFL quarterback, you're a two time pro bowler, you're setting franchise records, you're going to attract a lot of people that want something from you. Like, I bet you there was a point in your life, I mean, maybe it's now at an all-time high, who knows, to where people 
are around you because they want something from you, whether it's the cameo or whether it's, you know, they want you to invest in their opportunity or they just want the cool factor of being around you because you're a freaking awesome dresser. I don't know. But how do you <laughs> how do you surround yourself with the right people and kind of smell out like these people are just around me because they want something from me versus like, nah, dude, these are lifers. Like I could hitch my trailer yeah. to this person. Yeah, I think first it goes back to my morals and my values and, and my upbringing. You know, I credit my parents for that. Um, but really, I mean, it's something that coming into the NFL, that's something that I learned early on. Um, even going back to college is the art of saying no mm -hmm. and being comfortable saying no, because I think a lot of guys have trouble with that, Right. Um, especially when there are – um, there's an entourage or there's just, there's all these things that pull at you. And, but I think it's also, I, I do have an ability of reading people and finding and seeing through, all right, what is the intent here? What is someone's intentions when they're asking me to do something or be a part of a business deal or, right. you know, come to some event or whatever the case is. But that's just something when I made my transition to the NFL, I made it a point to surround myself with whether it's a financial advisor, an agent, um, lawyers, you know, I mean, I've got a wonderful wife now who has the best uh, radar for people. I mean, she can, you know, smell it from a mile away, you know, bad intentions or anything like that. So it's, I think it's just over time, um, something that, um, I've just learned how to be able to smell that stuff out and just my groundedness, I guess, you know, that I could say that I have that I don't get caught and I don't get caught up in some of that stuff. I'm not a night owl. I don't go out. That's never been me. And so, especially now with five kids and I'm usually <laughs> tired I, usually by nine o'clock, I'm tired as all get out. But I just think that I have a good radar for people and that's just an, an innate quality discerning wife man so important there's a reason why the bible calls wisdom a she write that down guys mm. there's a reason why bible calls wisdom a she um so this is kind of a personal question but i want to ask you it um top quarterback in the nfl a lot of people want something from you everybody wants to give you something you're traveling you're on the road because people ask me this all the time like especially during you know event season i'm on the road a lot and if I found my identity through what I do on the stage and helping people raise money, like, you know, you can come off the stage and, you know, people in the room aren't ugly and they've been drinking a lot and they're, you know, they all want to give you something, this and that. Oh, you're the best. And if that was my driving force and if I didn't have a secure relationship with my wife, I might stumble like so many men have. Uh, you and Lori, five kids, been married all throughout your NFL career. How did you stay faithful to your wife and how was that uh, versus some people that may not have, what kept you grounded so that you weren't another statistic? Well, I think it's my faith number one, first and foremost, but also she's my best friend, you know, all that she's gone through with me along my side through my career, you know, we're coming up uh, in a week and a half on our 15th anniversary um and i know it, it and we talk about that does it feel like it i'm like well when i sit back and i think about five kids five or six moves i'm like you know we've been through some stuff um but you know that the, that whole notion that whole thought i mean it was never even a glimmer in my eye i mean i i'm married you know the most incredible person beautiful inside and out um, so smart, keeps me grounded, um, right. and is the most wonderful mother. So, I mean, it's, it had, it hasn't been hard for me. It's not even a thought, a question whatsoever. Um, but that's just, I mean, that's my personal situation. So y'all have been through some ups and downs. What, what can you say that you can share with us was hands down the hardest time of your life? And did you want to quit? Did I want to quit? anything like the, the, anything quit, the, quit life take your life quit the marriage no. quit football anything did you want to quit well no i've never wanted to do anything with my life with my marriage 
I mean, my the year that we were in Oakland was trying because of how it ended in Houston. My career, you know, I was going to be the bridge quarterback there to the next guy, you know, all off season, and then the week of week one, it gets put on me that we they decided to start the rookie uh, Derek Carr. Great kid, still talk to him to this day. Um, so that rug being pulled out from under me was tough to deal with professionally with I, what I had just gone through in Houston. While my wife had just the week prior got put on bed rest in the hospital, um, pregnant with our fourth fourth child, um, you know we're in California. Our parents are in Atlanta oh. and Alabama, pretty far away. So fortunately, they were both retired at the time, so they could come and help with our other three. While my wife was in the hospital, twenty minutes away, and I had to go to football. And, you know, she was there a month and then, you know, unexpectedly, I'm in New England on the road uh, getting ready for a game. I get the call that she had to be rushed into the OR to, you know, have a C emergency C-section for our son. This was all very, and I got on the plane, the team knew what I was going through and I flew back so I could be there with her. And, and, and it was, it was a very difficult season. Uh, most, half the time I slept on a, the hospital, uh, uh, kind of fold out couch, you know, and got up still at five in the morning to go to football. And then I came right back dealing with the Bay area traffic, like, and all the emotions going on off the field. Um, right. You know, it's hard. It, it puts football in perspective. It puts the game in perspective when those things are going on. And, you know, some of the things did mean life or death, you know, it was right. close um, moments away that, whether it was my wife or my son, like it could have, things could have been different and it definitely put football in perspective. And can I say that I was 150% all in on football every day? I'd be lying if I said, yes. I mean, there were days where it was just like, I was going through those motions and that's hard because it's something, the discipline and the work ethic and football has been my life, but this is life. What yeah. I'm, what I have going on over here is life. So that whole situation, that year of time, um, getting through that. And then even once my son did get out of the NICU and come home um, after three months, he was on oxygen at home for six more months. So having that constant um, thing going on with him and the, the assistance breathing, like that was all so, so hard. Um, but it it really grounded us even more so than we were. And, but that, that was tough professionally you know i can say that was an instance where i was like gosh i, I maybe this is it for me football wise so, um let me ask you about that got, because then, but then we then we got out of that right you, i mean you've played and you've succeeded at the highest level if you could just take me to that glimpse of time feeling like this might be it also life or death situation with wife at home from a mindset standpoint what do you say to yourself in the morning? How do you motivate yourself? Is it survival mode or is it still Matt Schaub, the the great quarterback that's going to go and dominate and compete today? Like, how do you set your mind to accomplish something when you're going through hell? It was hard. There were some days where it was really hard. Um, it's a great question. I there were days where it was, everything was really good. And she was in a good spot. He was in a good spot. And I knew they were in great care while I had to go to football. Um, so it was easier to have the mindset of I'm going to, I'm going to dominate this day. It was, it was easier to get up and say that and then go and live it and do it. There were other days it was harder that my mind was one place and trying to concentrate on something else was very difficult. And it had to be more um, proactive in my self-talk to keep it going. Like, Hey, focus, you know, they're fine. Like reach out. Okay. Everything's good. Like the, the trust in, especially when they were in the medical um, in the hospital, in the medical facility, like knowing that they had great care around them, that was comforting. Um, once they got released and were at home, Hey, there might be some complication. There might be things that happen. You know, I don't know. And anytime there was a phone call or a text message, it's like, what's going on. But fortunately at football during that time with the Raiders, I had great teammates. I did have coaches that while I've only been there, not even a year yet, um, 
they were very supportive. They understood what I had going on off the field. So that helped. But there were some mornings, like you asked, like it was a challenge to roll out of bed and say, all right, let's go. You know, like it had always been easy. My feet hit the ground and we're going, you know, it's all gas, no brakes. And um, I got to say, there were some breaks <laughs> throughout my time during that time period in the morning. What was harder for you? sitting on the bench watching Michael Vick and being his backup or sitting on the bench and watching Derek Carr and being his backup? What was harder? Yeah. Um, no, harder mentally. Bench. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting um, on the bench behind Derek Carr watching because um, of all I had done in my career, sitting on the bench watching Michael Vick, especially my first couple years. I mean, at that point in time, he was probably in the top three most visible athletes in the world. Yeah. You know I mean? He had the NFL you know, polarized, you know, on the cover of Madden and his athletic ability, his talent next to Tiger Woods and say probably Kobe Bryant. I mean, those were the two other such visible athletes, no matter where they went. So for me, just taking notes and, you know, getting an idea, okay, when I get my opportunity to be a starter, these are how I can handle these situations. You know, I mean, all the things that he went through, I mean, that was, that was easy because it was a growth experience. I was learning um, as a young player, but after having gone through everything I did professionally and then, you know, having that season where I was watching, I wanted to be out there because I had been with those guys all off season. Um, and to have the opportunity, like, look, let me go out there and play. Let me show and like help Derek along. You know, I was, a, I'm sure looking back on, I mean, he learned a lot that season, uh, but there was a lot of growth that, that was needed to be done. And, you know, I wish I could have been more of an active participant uh, on the field uh, for those guys. Um, a couple more questions and I'll let you go at that time, you know, for people, for athletes who are watching this, that are in a position and I'll just say this, you're backing up somebody that, you know, you're better than deep, deep down inside, whatever it is, you're a better basketball player than the person in front of you. You're a better pitcher than the guy starting, whatever it is. How do you handle it the right way when you're backing up somebody that, you know, you should not be backing up? Well, it's, it, it's something that they, everyone around you is looking at you. They, you know, they, they know whether you're, when you're the quarterback, that just comes with the territory, whether you're the backup or the starter, you're young, you're old. People want to see how you react. How do you handle uh, tough times, good times? How are you emotionally? Are you even keeled? Do you get too excited or do you go in the tank when something bad happens to you? Well, I still looked at myself. I mean, at that point, I'm in year, I mean, what was it? 11. So guys are looking to see how I react and I handle things. How am I on the sideline? How am I on the day to day? Can I still be an influence on the other players? That's something that once I stepped into that role and then I came to Atlanta as the backup, I could help so many young guys on the offensive side of the football grow. If they just take a couple things away from that season and they say, Matt, help me learn how to do this or how to be a professional, what I need to do to on a day-to-day -day basis to be ready. How can I help the defensive players get ready for their the offense they're about to face? If I can just focus on the things of how I can impact others and I can help them be better, you know, that's, that's all the credit I need. I mean, I don't even need that credit. I just need to see it and hope it comes to fruition. It's um, there's so many ways you can be impactful and not focus on the tough thing that's right in right. front of you at your position. You try to be a servant leader in the best way you possibly can and not be so inward looking and try to look outward and see how you can make a better impact around or on those around you. So now in your life, you're retired from NFL. How does Matt Shaw become a servant leader now? How does he make an impact for other people? What's your life look like now? What's next? Yeah, so well, the, it's been kind of nice the last two falls to just enjoy the football season and have the right. weekends where I'm a servant leader to my kids right. <laughs> and I'm coaching them and and going and being at more of the events that I might have missed based on scheduling when I was playing. So that's been really fun to just have that time, be able to watch, sit back, watch football, um, working on a few things, working on a NFL Players Association executive director role that I'm working on and campaigning to be that next uh, director and, and be a candidate for that. There's a long search process going on currently. Uh, but I'm just enjoying dad mode and, and husband mode and being around for car line, pick up, drop off, going to events, keeping that calendar and schedule full. So, uh, but uh, excited for the next chapter for sure. 
how do we get golf with Matt Rogers on that schedule? Um, very easily. As long as we're in the same location, we can Let's make that go. work easily. Um, <laughs> lastly, before I let you go, we always like to ask our uh, guests, well, real quick. So going back to that executive director for NFLPA, why do you want that position? What does that position do? Yeah, I mean, you're basic. I mean, in a nutshell, you are the the voted on by the players. You are the staff leader of the membership that helps negotiate um, the collective bargaining agreements against the owners um, and the league, and advocate for the players. And sitting and back and evaluating my career and you know, experiencing three collective bargaining agreements and two executive directors coming through and just seeing how the CBAs have impacted all players physically, financially, emotionally um, throughout their careers. But then after they transition out of the game, um, seeing how they've been impacted in, in ways that, you know, yeah, the general public sometimes you, you hear it all the time, um, have opinions on that, but we're still, we're, we're, we're guys that have some serious issues that could be happening. So to, you know, step into a role to help advocate and lead the next generation of players um, as we come up pretty rapidly. I know we're seven years away, but the next CBA will be uh, in 2030. Um, so it's just something that's looking at all the teammates that I've had from the number one guys on the roster to the 60th man on the practice squad, trying to make an impact for their future. Um, you know, I just want to step into that role and see, see how I could do uh, taking that on. Dude, you are the man. Thank you so much for joining us. We always ask, you know, before we let you go, if you could leave one level up moment with our listeners, whether it's a quote, a verse, uh, a story, what would be your one level up moment with Matt Schaub? Ooh, wow. Well, how about I'll give you two? I'll give you a, a, a verse. One of my favorite ones. It's on one of my bands here, Matthew nineteen twenty six. with God, all things are possible. Um, really lean in on that one and try to have my kids lean in on that one. Um, hopes and dreams. You can accomplish anything with, with him. And, um, you know, one of my level up moments, you know, I'll go back to, I'll go back to college. I mean, that's such a, um, learning experience for most you're, you're going from boys to men, you know, and you're doing it in the context of division one football, you know, you learn a lot about yourself and, you know, we, you know, try to make this a little bit shorter of a story, but um, going into my um, senior year, I'm sorry, my junior year, you know, we had a lot of expectations and a lot of thoughts and I'm sorry, it was my senior year. Was it? I don't even remember what year it was. <laughs> uh, it was my junior year. There were a lot of expectations on our team and, you know, I got benched in our first game. And then I come to find out I wasn't going to start at Florida state the next week. And I was stretching before going out to the practice field that next week when I found out and our head coach at the time, Al grow, who was a great coach, great man. I still talk to him to this day. He was saw me and he just was walking down the steps and he said, you know, how, how are you feeling? And I said, feel great coach. Next time you put me in, you're not going to take me out. And I, you can tell he was kind of like, I wasn't expecting you to say that. And sure enough, you know, halfway through the game the next week, um, we weren't doing so good. And he put me back in and we made a valiant comeback. We fell short, but um, never went back, never came back out of the game and went on to, you know, win ACC player of the year. We won nine games yeah. that season. And, um, you know, he won coach of the year. But, you know, it started off so shaky. I mean, that taught me a lot about what I could go through as a, on the football field um, and taught me, you know, hey, this outlook, this perspective, you um, you know, while it doesn't solve every situation, it did for me in this instance. And it was a mindset that I tried to continue to carry on throughout the rest of my career in the NFL and, and my, my life. I love it, man. You are the man. Thank you so much. We got our speed five questions. You got to answer these five questions as fast as you can without okay. thinking before we let you go. All right. Let's All see right. if he answers them or if he avoids some of them because he has no idea what's coming out of <laughs> Here we go. Like one word, one word answers, or what are we doing? Pretty much one word answers. All right. If you, uh, all right. So as fast as you can, if you were never a football player, what would you have been? Baseball. Who's better, Tom Brady or Peyton Manning? Tom Brady. Is the NFL rigged? No. <laughs> 
Who's the best NFL coach of all time? Bill Belichick. Could you start in an NFL game right now? Patrick Mahomes. No. Could you, if they called you right oh, now? Oh, could I? I thought you said, who would I? Could I right now? I'd give you a game. Yeah! Absolutely. The competitor <laughs> never leaves. Matt Schaub, you are the man. Thank you so much. Which offensive line do I get? Uh, which offensive line would you pick? <laughs> Who's the best offensive line in the NFL right now? Oh, Philly's good. Philly's yes. offensive line's really good, yeah. Really? Yeah, they're solid. Absolutely. Who's your best friend on the team? Is it your center, your tackle, your receiver? Uh, I, I cannot go against any one of the five guys up front. I can't pick just one. I got you. Um, is my, uh, yeah, Dwayne Brown, my left tackle all those years in Houston, was my guy. That's awesome. Chris Myers, my center, was my guy. I had, you know, I had Wade Smith at left guard. I had Eric Winston at right tackle. I had other guys. I mean – they're all important because you if you can't step up in the pocket because it's not secure up front, that's a problem. If you have short edges around the outside, it needs to be nice. There needs to be somewhere to step yeah. up and somewhere to move. So I'm not going to pick one of those guys. Who's your favorite? Uh, I'll tell you who is my, mo my, my most, my, you know, my favorite one, Andre Johnson. I mean, come on now. Yeah, I mean, he's the freaking man. All those games you had to watch us come up there and uh, pick y'all apart. Dude, well, the good news is I had both of you on my fantasy team in 09, and I won the championship. What? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like a hypocrite, but I won money. Uh, who's your favorite uh, charity auctioneer of all time? Uh, Matt Rogers. Let's go! I love you, man. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching another week of Level Up. Please like, subscribe, and share. Come on. Two-time Pro Bowler, Pro Bowler MVP, you know what time it is. Share this episode. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for watching another week of Level Up. Hey.